Welcome, welcome, welcome to the Comic Corner. My name is Damon, and what we do here is we do news, reviews, and interviews. And today we have someone who's done both comics and TV from page to screen, the writer of Massive's new Kids and Monsters, Adam Lawson. Adam, how are you doing today? Dude, I'm great, Damon. Thanks for uh, thanks for bringing me in. Uh, I'm, I mean, I'm out here in Chicago um, shooting a commercial right now. And uh, I was trying to tell somebody how committed I am to comics. And like, this was my reading stack, you know, for the plane um, here. Look at that. And uh, I went through it, you know, and that's like, I'm definitely uh, a lover of comics, not just in the creation side, but like in the fandom side of it too. Like I genuinely love being there Wednesday, right? Like checking out the new reads. Like I'm, I'm genuinely excited by the whole experience of what is comics you know absolutely i've gone through your socials and we're going to talk about uh that aspect that you do as oh, well cool. like when you do reviews and stuff but first what i ask everyone whenever they come on for the first time what is your comic book origin story how did you get into all this in the first place as a fan yeah you know it's, it's funny because i was i just went you know i do these comic shop review tours and i went back to one that i i did where i first went to comics when i was 15 years old it's been 30 years since I've been there, right? And um, um, when I was a young kid, I didn't think much of superheroes because at the time, that's kind of all, only the comics I was present to, right? When you're a younger kid. And uh, I thought it was kind of like dumpy guys in their underwear. And I remember um, it was when Jim Lee and Chris Claremont did X-Men. And I remember seeing this Cyclops with all these muscles and these sunglasses and you know, Jean Grey and everyone was just this beautiful, radiant woman. And you're like, wait, these guys aren't just dumpy guys in their underwear, right? It it, it ignited something in me. And so um, certainly my art tastes have grown and expanded since then, but there's like a deep place in my heart for Jim Lee because it was like, when I saw those images, I said, oh, my friends are like, no, this stuff's cool now. They, they made it cool. And, um, and that's what got me going into the shop. And I remember reading you know, the early X-Men titles that really like ignited for me. And then I, you know, I did come, I was reading comics for several years and then I kind of fought, fell out of it. Kind of the crossover multiverse sort of stuff, sort of, I just got kind of like lost in it and uh, not, not, nothing, nothing evil to say, but I just kind of like lost me. Right. And then a few years later, I was uh, working on snakes on a plane and Sam Jackson came to set and he was reading uh, Brian Azzarello's 100 Bullets. Right. And I remember looking at that and I'm like, well, if it's cool enough for Sam Jackson, then it's going to be cool enough for me. Right. And so I went to this comic book shop after the shoot and said, Hey, I'm looking for this thing, 100 Bullets. And I remember reading that first trade. Right. And which I think it's still one of the, the one of the greatest graphic novels in, in, in decades. Right. And it, um, it blew my mind. Right. Dame as to what a comic book could be right because it wasn't a superhero story and it really sort of blew my mind as far as the kinds of stories you can really experience in comics and that changed kind of everything for me again right it was like jim lee and then azarello and Eduardo rizzo right that like said oh wait now these things can be all kinds of stories and that kind of led me to jason aaron scalped and to alan moore's swamp thing and then the skies kind of became the limit. And then I've been swimming in it ever, ever since. Man, that is one of the best origin stories I've heard in a while on this show. Adam, good grief. He threw a Sam Jackson in there. Some of the best graphic novels after that. Man, like, so usually I follow up with, you know, who's like a writer that you follow, but you mentioned Jim Lee and way early on, it was like those early X-Men days outside of like the Cyclops and the Jean Grey. Like, what was it about the X-Men that really just kind of like brought you in on them other than just, like, I guess yeah. maybe it could have just been like the fact that it's like that drama aspect of it all, right? That's yeah. So of it. <laughs> yeah. I mean, at the time, you know, there was, you know, it was definitely like a, a space opera type of a feeling right to it. There was this incredible drama and you know the character of you know bishop was kind of coming to play you know from the future so it kind of had this like it had sort of like an edge to it when he showed up and i really loved his character um and so i think that that like feeling that it had like it was like 
instead of just like, we are saving the day, it like had emotional uh, structure and drama to it and like emotional consequence. Like that's when it sort of elevated for me when it was like, oh, people died and it hurt or like they made the wrong choice, right? Or somebody got selfish. Like a lot of these more human emotions and weaknesses in the characters really electrified it for me, right? Where it wasn't always so like we got the bad guys. Instead, it was like we're wrestling with ourselves in this process. Like our identity is a mutant. The world's kind of against us in some instances, you know. And that was a really exciting thing to, to see that, right? And then <clears throat> I think, as you, you know, as you kind of like, follow other great creators i think about you know like another book that sort of shaped me was uh frank miller's the hard goodbye right and i remember just the <clears throat> the the dialogue you know the way he's it's going to be blood for blood and by the gal in the old days the reckless days the all or nothing days all this sort of like crazy dialogue and these you know sort of characters who were reprehensible but doing the right thing um those sort of complex character emotions really um, that's what that's what drew me in, right? Mm, absolutely, absolutely. I mean, it's it's outside of the action when it comes to those books. It's the interpersonal right. drama. It's like yep. it's what everyone always says about Spider Man. You care about Spider Man not because he's Spider Man, but because of the Peter Parker of it all, right? It all comes back down to yeah. the interpersonal relationships, the actual, the true lives, the drama, all of it, all of that as well. We yep. are here to discuss your new book, Kids. And monsters published by massive i've been reading the description of it and instantly caught me the second it says when stranger things meets pokemon yeah can you explain that for me you know that was kevin ronatelli you know uh, one of the publishers that massive that kind of gave that angle on it and i i got a good chuckle out of that because essentially at the core of this story is it's this this group of three kids who um find monsters in their backpacks and they get pulled into this supernatural war that mirrors uh, the war at home that's going on, right? Their parents are on the verge of divorce. And for anyone in this country who's been touched by it, and probably everyone has been, there's nothing more frightening than being a child, right? Who, mm -hmm. you know, your could your family tear apart, right? And I think that was sort of the driving emotion for this story was like, how, you know, what's the most frightening thing for a 12-year-old? It's that, right? or a 16 year old. And, um, and so I wanted to play that out as they battled in this supernatural war where you have these red beasts there, you can see on the cover. Um, they're trying to rip, there's this world inside of our world, and then the world that you and I both know, right? And there's these seven rings that hold it together. And they're trying to destroy them and rip the two worlds in two, very much like what's happening with their parents at home. So it's um and they're dealing with it the kids are dealing with it in different ways you know mally's angry and she's smashing things and gatsby is, is a bit more of a math chemistry head and he's um you know kind of diving internally on it he's desperate to try and save it he's siding with his mom she's siding with the dad and then we've got jin su mally's boyfriend who's on the ride for them um and their relationship as they're going through this journey is the um <clears throat> is a bit of that like is a mirror of their parents' struggles, right? Like now she has to deal with like the complexity of actually a relationship. Oh, wait, it's not so easy to just like be happy instantly all the time. Um, and these needs and expectations cannot be met. Um, you know, and so this is them just trying to save the world and save their family. And I think with like the Pokemon side of it, you know, like when I said, mentioned Stranger Things, it's because it's, you know, it's teen, it's, you know, younger teenage kids that have real emotions, deep, strong emotions against this, you know, wild supernatural villain, right? And then the Pokemon side of it, I think is because of the sort of the craziness of this world within the various monsters that they find in backpacks that are kind of, you can only see the backpack that has the monster suited for you. So Mally's is like this crazy orc and Gatsby's is much more of this tinkering druid um, and Jin Su's is like this martial arts master. And so there's these different um, things. Um, and, there's this, and then and then also to their enemy, they're facing these red beasts. It kind of gives us this Pokemon-ish crazy world. So that's maybe a long explanation to your uh, simple question, Damon. But yeah. 
No, it's that is fascinating, especially from the divorced children's aspect, because as a child of divorced and, a, you know, one of millions yeah, of kids yeah. who are you know, children of divorce, that is such like a yeah. relatable and it's something that you surprisingly don't see a whole lot in media, honestly. Like yeah. you see some of it, but not a whole lot for as common as that is. It's it's surprising in that sense. Uh, going right. back to the monsters themselves and like, you know, the, the creatures that these kids get, like what's the relationship between them and those creatures? Or is it more like a tool aspect? Is it like a friendship? Is it a partnership? It's so it's kind of a mix of all three, right? Mm. Um, and so, you know, with um Gatsby's. Uh, Gren is his monster, and um, and he's revealed in the first issue, and you can um, see the epic art on him. He's um, a bit of like almost like a sage, right? It's sort of like the uh, like this wise sage that's helping, you know, helping Gatsby cope with his emotions, teaching him about the world. So he's like his partner and his leader and his friend, you know, maybe the dad who is become despondent from him, you know, and kind of been mm -hmm. retreating emotionally, kind of fills in a bit for that. So, and then whereas like Jin Su's his monster is very different, right? His becomes a lot more utilitarian. He controls his with the remote control, like a video game style experience. Um, and their relationship is a little bit more utilitarian um, with some, some more subtle um, character interaction, right? So, and then like Mally's helps her deal with like her internal anger, right? And, and like and like a manifestation of that. So it's a mix of like kind of like what you said with those three things. Um, and 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 like they are gonna, the monsters are in a way gonna help lead them through the battle and in out inside and outside. When you're creating a series like this, so uh, with your artist Maxi Dello. Yeah. What like, what's your favorite part about the creative aspect behind that? When you're working back and forth with your artists that you don't necessarily get when you're working on like a television show or a movie. Yeah, no, there is something um, quite intimate, you know, about this uh, writer artist relationship, especially because in this case, I was making the book um, outside of Massive early on, and then and then and then mm. they picked it up. Where you're making all the decisions, you're the editor, you know, writer, editor, letter. Um, all in one and there's this intimacy of when you've crafted a page and you pass it to the artist and he's got some ideas and he's thought you know wouldn't it mean cool if and there's this back and forth and then the page lands right and that like surprise slash satisfaction um, um is probably the most magical part of the making process of a comic that isn't replicated on set um because set is the opposite of an intimate experience it's you know it's uh, i'm going to be shooting uh tomorrow and there's going to be 75 people there with a massive amount of pressure and deadlines and times and a client and all kinds of things and it's the opposite of intimate um there's almost no intimate creation it's um whereas that so that's a very unique thing and in a way it, it fulfills you in a way that making uh you know, a film and TV doesn't. Um, and so it's pretty special. So and especially with is, Maxi, oh yeah, go ahead. Yeah, Maxi go ahead. is, is, is a true, uh, he's truly committed, or at least in my works, he and I have done now three books together. He, he, he's, he dreams about it. He thinks about it. He's swimming in it. He's not just like passing off pages to get a check. He He's living for it. And so there is this like, energy that comes together he's like i thought about this page and wouldn't it be cool if and and you go back and forth and then when his, i just love his style which i think is a little bit reminiscent of like a james heron um in its flavor um and the way he inks um because he you know he goes from red lines to inks you know no pencils and um it's anyways I, that's really rad and Mike Spice with the color is really bringing this all to life, too. It's like a band when you make a it comics. It's like a really small band, you know? Everyone right. works together. Sometimes a guitarist comes in, who I like to say guitarist is like the artist in a way. They'll put a little extra spice to things and, yeah. you know, like, oh, that's cool. And then you kind of go off on it, let them cook for a little bit. That's that's the beauty of comics. That's the beauty of the medium, right? Everyone right. works together, but it is, like you said, in such an intimate way. It's not like you have intimate. all these combined things going in a room and you're trying to piece all that together so much smaller intimate is the perfect word for it 
Yeah. Yeah. No, Mike Spicer, who I've loved, you know, he and I've done a couple of books together and, you know, he's such a great colorist because he, he brings it to life in, you know, in such an organic way, mm -hmm. right? Like his, he's not just doing flats, but he's also not doing sort of like the, the Marvel look either. He's got this thing that feels a little bit more handmade. Um, Damon, I think is very special. Um, and also because of Maxi's art feels very handmade there. They just fit very well together. And I, I love what Mike does, the choices he makes. It's like you throw a page at him. And at first you, you know, like the very first time we did something, you, you threw a lot of notes and now you just throw it and it comes back better than you'd hoped, you know? So. That's the beauty of it. This book coming out to comic shops on August 14th. Go to your comic shops, go pre-order it. Use the diamond previews link. We have the code in, you know, if you're watching on the video, if you have it on Spotify, you can follow the link there. Many different ways to go pre-order this book. There is something I wanted to ask you just about what you do sure. on the side and what you do on your socials, which yeah. I think is so fascinating. I haven't ever interviewed a comic writer who does what you do which is also do reviews and go into comic shops. So my first question with that is when you are making a comic, a show, whatever it is, and you're reviewing it, but you're creating that project, what is this something that you wished reviewers and critics talked about more that you don't think is discussed enough? Yeah, I, I think I always felt this, Damon. It's like, I'd like to know what Alan Moore is reading. I'd like to know what Rick Remender is reading. You know what I mean? I'd like, I'd like to hear what Ram V is reading, you know, um, I love their work. I'd love to see what's in their head. And I think that, you know, what, what I always say about my reviews is I don't do what I consider like a critical review um, because I'm not interested in, in belittling other creators. I'm only review books I love, right? Because I think that this is a space, at least for me, that's about the love of the game. And um, I don't think people have any time to like, hey, here's a book you shouldn't read. Like, what? wait, you know, right? Like, who has time for that life? And so I feel like what, what I want to share with this is like, I love the game inside and out. Like, I love to read it as much as I love to make it. And I think that coming from a creator of saying like, hey, here's what I love. You know, like it was interesting to hear about Rob Liefeld was talking about um, Daniel Warren Johnson, right? And it's great, dear. Rob Liefeld, somebody who you grew up looking at his lines, you know what I mean? Uh, created characters you've, you know, seen for your whole life, right? Mm -hmm. And here, like, what's, what's his head? Where's his head at? And I can understand there's some sensitivity about not creating feuds or whatever or problems. But I think in a spirit of like love and admiration to other creators, it's it's really an an exciting way to spread it, and the same thing that you on the comic, the, the local comic shop, which I know, you know, comic shops over the last decade have had some struggles, and it's like, how can I help ignite the joy of going to these things and participating in them because they mean a lot to me, and if they go away or hurt, like how does our how does the experience you know kind of is going to change forever for the fans in a, and I in, a, in probably a way that's not better I I wouldn't say and so like. Um, the love and, those, and a lot of those shop owners, you know, they're pouring their hearts into these shops. They're not making millions, you know, there's no millionaire shop owners, right? This is love of the game stuff. Yeah. And that kind of like respect back to say, Hey guys, we pre as a creator, I appreciate you and your commitment because you build an arena that makes it exciting for people to come and read our stuff. So I think that's, I think that's meaningful. Some may disagree, but I, for me, like, that's meaningful. And I wish, you know, like I was saying that I could hear from, you know, what is Tatsuki Fujimoto? What manga is he reading? You know, I would like to know that. So comic shops for myself, so beyond important. I go to mine every single week. We have such a fun group that we all go every Wednesday and we just chat, you know, sometimes, sometimes we chat about the books, but a lot of times it's become like that family, that second family aspect of totally. it. Where you, right. And it's become a place where, yeah, we can talk about our favorite shows or books, but it's just, Hey, how are you doing? Right. Like, how are things going with you? And it's that community aspect of the comic shop that I absolutely adore. And I loved what you said about just, you know, talking about the books themselves. Cause that was literally my next question was, <laughs> are you read a lot of books and you talk about a lot of books right now, but give me, if you can, just like a handful that you just think are so special that you think people really need to read. Yeah, like um, 
you know, it's funny. I just have my my stack here uh, that I was that I was reading. So one thing I would say that everybody should be reading right now um, is so this is the one hand, the six the six the six fingers and one hand that Ram B and Dan Watters are doing. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is feels like one of the greatest crime comics in. I can't remember how long since back to hundred bullets, right? Where it was that edge of your seat, that like parking lot read of a book and where they, where they truly executed where Ram passes it to Dan and Dan passes it back and forth, the two sides of this story and how actually complimentary it is and the payoff that comes. Like, cause I've, I've seen attempts at that, but never to execute at this level. Mm -hmm. So if I were to say, you should be reading the one hand and the six fingers for sure. And uh, it's truly a joy. Um, I would say another book that I'm absolutely loving um, from Vault is Barbaric. Um, Barbaric, yes. It's just, it's just an incredibly fun ride. Um, mm -hmm. You know, they've done like Queen of Swords and some other one shots that were really meaningful and fun. And um, I think Vault as a, as a publisher over the last couple of years has been creating titles that I am just like, I got to see what they're doing next. I got to so see fun. What... some of the so fun books that death stalker book and has been Stalker's doing so hilarious, silly, right? Hilarious. That's funny. Cause I went and rewatched the movie I was shooting and I grabbed the book and I watched the movie at night and then read the comic, you know, and it's like Tim like took this like bad B movie and even made it funnier and more engaging. And like, well, th that was totally something leaned into it totally leaned in in all the right ways and that's i mean that's great comic storytelling mm -hmm. um that i just that i've just absolutely loved another book i've been loving is kaya from west craig um, yep. this is a really uh, it's a fun it's a it's a fantasy story you know it's a it, it can works for all ages like a little bit like kids and monsters more you know hardier themes but works all ages right and um great fantasy story about this boy who would be prince and his sister with this robotic arm who has to protect him and um he just poured his heart into it and it's west craig's incredible art you know from uh from deadly class and um and i would say the last thing is rick remenders the sacrificers i've loved rick you know for years i finally got to meet him um here in la and um and I, you know and but this story with max fumara's art is this like heartbreaking gut-wrenching fantasy story that uh really i mean it's 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 like a left hook for him you don't see it coming some of like this great mix of silent storytelling with hard-hitting emotion like usually you know he's a wordy guy right like it's witty and wordy and this thing is uh is a different ride so so that's what i would recommend uh if you're at your local shop grab those off the shelf right now i think what myself and all my co-hosts we say every week is we're just we're in such a great age of comic book storytelling, not just within the superhero stuff. Because, yeah, there's a lot of good superhero books going on the right. shelf as well. But there's so many great stories outside of that that if you just want to expand, you know, what it really shows. And we mentioned it before, what the comic book as a medium can do with horror, with sci-fi, with mystery. There's so many amazing books out there that just like deserve so much love. And it's just it's like, as we've been saying, such a great era we're in right now. It is, so, it, I mean, it is a freaking great era. I feel like it is this incredible wild west where it's we're getting to reinvent itself. And you see a lot of great creators like Jeff Johns leaving and starting Ghost Machine. Um, you see, you know, with James Tinian, you know, these creators that are saying, let's expand into this into this you know independent world and it's not that it's you're mad at what happened in the past it's just that's the past and it's like what's this new new stories and new characters that we can get uh, you know that we can get to explore and it's uh anyways yeah i i totally agree like and i feel like you know i was um doing a review on berserker uh, a, a series I've loved. Uh, I did a commercial with Keanu Reeves for Cyberpunk, oh. and lovely, lovely guy. And um, and um, you know, like what an incredible, you know, Ron Garney, who's just amazing legacy, right? And he and like you have this mix up of Keanu and Kind and Garney together, building this like totally out of the box IP of just this, you know, endless engine of violence um, mm. that you 
that you can't uh, you can't really get anywhere else. Right? Like this is from the mind of of Keanu Reeves um, and Garney and Ka Kind. And uh, I mean, boy, it's it's an exciting time. I feel like movies is this maybe a not as exciting time. You know, um, I feel like there's maybe been a little. Maybe this is maybe in, in in U.S. movies. It's maybe been less exciting, but in America, but in American comics, it's like this is amazing time. So many great ideas going on. Speaking of ideas, like what when what are the similarities when you are like executive producing these movies and TV shows and doing these comics? Like, what similarities are there when you're writing a book like that that you're able to draw from to each other? Yeah, one thing that I really think is important um that that i draw from oftentimes is that sometimes i see um in writers uh in comic books as they are trying to do the work with their words mm. um they're trying to make a page work because of their words they're trying to make the dialogue drive the story instead of the realization like in a film or anything it isn't actually what drives the story the art is driving the story and you're guiding this river, right, with these words. And how can I not say what I'm already what was already being seen with the art? How can I, you know, see this through the image that's going to land? And then how do I support it with the words, right? Like I think like Tim Sale and Jeff Loeb were the I think the, one of the best combos ever, and their ability to like. Tim to set up, put up a page, and then Jeff to just hit it with just enough dialogue to make it punch and then not give you any more so that you didn't like uh, get sort of like bogged down with it, if that makes sense. And I think that um, that lesson from cinema, which is like, you don't have to say it. We can just cut to a close up of it, right? Like, remember, so I think that's been a really nice comparison. I also think another thing. Is that in oftentimes in you know when I was writing Escape the Night, you were often thinking about setups and payoffs, right? And I think sometimes in comics, especially in indie comics, people would think about like, oh, I want to tell them about my world. I want to, um, <coughs> excuse me, I want to explain this cool thing. Like nobody wants to ex be explained the cool thing or hear about your world. They would just want to see what's being set up and what's being paid off, right? And then the world can happen around it, you know. And so trying to think like I'm setting up right now in Kids and Monsters, there is this cr these cracks that are happening in the world and they're consuming Gatsby and Mally's childhood experiences like his fort, their treehouse. In, in a way, it's metaphorical. It's like taking their childhood away from them, right? Because it's vanishing away if this, their family falls apart, right? And so, you know, we're now setting this up in page one of issue one. And how am I going to land that? So this thing that we are feeling along the way, it, you know, that we're seeing, it's a metaphor. It's also an emotional thing. It's subtle, but then I'm going to, I need to then pay it off in a loud way, right? Like how can I get subtle payoffs, subtle setups to pay off in loud ways? Um, that's oftentimes how in movies, like you think the sixth sense is the greatest example of a subtle foreshadowing with a loud payoff, right? It, I see dead people transforms the whole film in one line. And it's just subtle things that you were watching but weren't flagging. So when it gets turned on you, it, it's a really exciting feeling. Not saying I'm gonna deliver that. It's one of the best, that's one of the best turns in, in the history of you know of 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 the of cinema, right? But saying thinking like how can subtle setups have big payoffs and how can like um strong like um like if you have like a loud setup for example um oh there's these red beasts that are going to destroy the world you're obviously setting up a big climax at the end right mm. beasts are after the rings they're going to go get them there's going to be a big battle right how can then you surprise people and give them the big battle they didn't expect, right? Versus because when people see these setups, they're because we're so trained as an audience. You're you're thinking, oh, I know what that payoff is. But if you can think, this is what they're going to expect. What's just here to the left of that that they won't expect? 
I think that is something to be that has really been valuable, you know, when jumping into comics, you know, to try to preserve those um, preserve those aspects of, of of narrative television and film storytelling. You know, especially when I'm thinking about like when I was doing Save the Night, and I'm like, I got, I'm going to set up something here in episode one, and then see episode ten, I'm going to pay it off, and um, and you know, and, and nuancing and touching it along the way, and it being cathartic at the end versus being underwhelming or too obvious. I was going to go back to something you mentioned fairly on. I was going to say shout out Tim Sale and Jeff Lowe because we actually, one of my favorite Superman stories, Superman for all seasons, which we've done a, oh, right. what we do here is right. our, our, like our, a lot what the comic corner was intended for and still we strive for is to welcome newer comic book readers into the space. So oh, yeah. we do comic book reading clubs uh, like That's a lot cool, of people man. do and what I bring in some friends who are just completely new into comics and we had right. them bring in and it was like favorite Superman story. We're going to start with Superman for all seasons. And so good. It's just absolutely incredible. And you mentioned right. great storytelling just now for newer writers. And this is my last question for you for newer writers who are just trying to get into whatever it is, whether it's comics, sure. whether it is, you know, producing TV shows and movies, what is one piece of advice you'd give to all of them? I, I think um, I can't emphasize this enough is that most folks have a high level of ambition when you're starting and a really low level of craft. And what people ahead of you are looking for is people with a really high level of craft, right? And a high level of ambition because low ambition people, no one has time for them, right? You just, <laughs> you have no one has time for them. And so oftentimes you feel like you can bridge this gap between ambition and craft by just increasing this. But you, it's the craft you have to increase. And I think that one of the most common things is that people keep thinking about their book being published, their TV show being on the air. And really you're like, bro, this draft isn't that, isn't good enough yet, right? Have you rewritten this 13 times? Well, no. Well, then you haven't really paid the price of the craft. And I think there is, I can't emphasize that enough that your brain to be thinking all day long instead of, oh, I can't wait till this TV show's on the air. They'd be thinking, wait, uh, that line in the fourth act isn't landing. I can do it better because that's the brain that people ahead of you, that's the one they want in the room. Cause the guy can't just wait to get their stuff on air. They got no interest in because they put stuff on air all the time. They want to talk to somebody who says, Oh no, no, you're right. Yeah, and that second act of episode two, I didn't set that up. Right. Let me get back in. That's the brain they're really looking for. And so, what I would say, and it, it's not, doesn't mean you're not ready now or whatever. It's a really spend your time daydreaming about the quality of your work in relation to the best people doing it. Um, I think that's the best, the best advice I can give and that you can't overemphasize the time spent getting better and refining your work. As they say, practice makes perfect. Nothing's ever perfect the first time. You got to keep at it. You got to keep going at it. You got to keep making things better, refine it, polish it like a diamond. Adam, thank you so much right. for taking the time. Kids and Monsters out in August, but where can people find you on the interwebs? Yes, yeah, so you can find me at Gifted Rebels Co. Um, on Instagram, on Twitter, on YouTube, and TikTok. Um, I drop comic reviews, uh, tours of comic shops, and also just whatever cool comics and stuff I'm into. Um, but yeah, you can always find me there. And um, Twitter, I think, is the most fun because you tend to talk more, but any of those places. Adam, thanks again. You can find the show on Twitter at Comic Corner Pod. You can find myself at Damon Tweet on Twitter. You can find me on Instagram at Damon.gram. You can find me on TikTok at Damon Talks Comics. And if you're sensing a theme, you're getting a theme, you can kind of sense what the handle is from there on out. That'll do it for today's episode. Make sure you please like, subscribe. You have so many great things going on here at the Agents of Fandom YouTube channel and Spotify channel. So please check all of them out. And more importantly, go read some comics.
Go support your local comic shops. And until next time, we have another great episode for you lined up next week. We'll see you then.